on this and what opportunities lay ahead for the semiconductor sector, let's bring in Ed Snyder, co-founder and managing director of Charter Equity Research. Uh, Ed, great to have you with us. Um, joining us, uh, as I understand, from a, from a park in California, which is a great yeah. shot. Um, so, so do you think this will be a smart acquisition? Uh, yes, it is. It's very smart. Uh, AMD is on a surge after Intel uh, tripped on last quarter, and they've done very well uh, with, their new pro with their new products. Uh, their stock is up significantly, so this is a perfect time to use that currency to acquire a Xilinx, which gives them a much bigger footprint in the cloud, and the cloud is where you want to be. Every semiconductor company shipping into the cloud right now is doing quite well. So it's a, it's a smart move on their part. It's also just the latest in a string of very big semiconductor deals this year. So NVIDIA is trying to buy ARM for $40 billion. We saw analog devices and Maxim. Ed, we're assuming these go through from a regulatory perspective. Where does this leave the U.S. semiconductor industry? What does it look like? How different is it by the end of the year? Well, I mean, consolidation is almost inevitable at this point. And even before COVID, uh, if you, growth was slowing in all these areas, um, from even some of the smaller companies. And when that starts to happen, uh, they accumulate a lot more cash. And when you get more cash, then you look at M&A. It actually puts uh, uh, the U.S. in a pretty good position, um, semiconductor-wise. One, we lead the world in almost all these technologies. And secondly, as soon as you know, smart consolidations like this, uh, the uh, the company being acquired, in this case Xilinx, is going to have a lot more resources and a lot more access to markets they may not be able to to, uh, to address by themselves. So, you know, there are always the goofball M&A acquisitions. Uh, you can look at Intel for several of those in the last 10 years. But generally speaking, if you do something like this, uh, and the ones that have been announced all make um, logical sense and the markets, I think, will get stronger and the U.S. position will get stronger over time. So, Ed, is anyone suggesting that we're kind of marking the top for the sector, given that there has been so much M&A? No, actually, I think you're going to see a big surge in the semiconductor sector over the next um, probably four quarters or so. If you recall, we started the down cycle in semis late 18 or so. You saw it from everybody, from TI, from Avago, from um, just about everybody who wasn't super focused right in the cloud. And that was normally going to end about the beginning of this year. You saw signs that it was starting to turn and then COVID hit uh, and that kind of confused everything, pushed out orders, et cetera. So now what you're seeing, we've gotten four or five pre-announcements, significant upside pre-announcements this quarter already, um, that the uh, semis uh, demand is very strong in cloud, it's very strong in audio, and so everybody's surprised. And uh, NXP said this, Corvo said this the other day, that you're seeing a big surge in, in retail or uh, phones because of Apple and what's happening um, with Huawei. Mm -hmm. So you're actually probably in the first stages of a semiconductor rebound that'll push into next year. Yeah, I, th I think what, what other investors are trying to figure out, broader investors, Ed, is, is whether that is a cyclical tell for the economy. The fact that semis have been in such a good leadership position here, there, there's M&A, which is a sign of confidence, there are some interesting tailwinds, or whether this is industry specific around things like 5G. How do you answer that? No, I think it's wider than that, because if you look at the specifics of the upside reports, especially out of companies like Broadcom um, and even Qualcomm, and AMD, there are a lot to do with the cloud. Obviously, as people have to social distance and, and you have to stay at home and use Zoom, et cetera, you're going to see a lot more access to the cloud. We've definitely seen that. But you're also seeing industrial demand starting to pick up. Um, you're seeing the, the cloud service providers pull more networking equipment through. And then wireless, 5G is driving a big upside demand in the RF names, actually in the baseband names now too. So you've got several different factors that are driving upside. It's not, I don't think, one sector specific. And you're going to see that when TI reports next week, very, very broad product line. Um, that's a kind of a harboringer of what's going to happen in the next, next quarters. I think that's going to be a good report too. Josh, are any of the analyst community talking uh, about likely takeover targets that are left? You know, I mean, listen, the, the M&A in, in the semis, Wolf, um, is nothing new. We've seen that for a while. It does seem to be heating up, and that's no surprise given the environment. We're seeing interest rates and valuation. Um, one thing I would just go back to quickly is I, I think you can certainly understand the strategic fit of this move. AMD is trying to expand their product portfolio. They are well known for what is known as CPUs and GPUs. Um, if you do acquire Xilinx, you move into FPGAs too. Those are um, very efficient, easily reprogrammable microchips that are in a lot of hot end markets, right? So 5G, but also with auto industrial. Um, so you can understand why AMD would be making the move. The stock did finish down today, though, and I think that's because some investors might 
flag some potential risks here. There's execution risk. This is a big acquisition for AMD's executive team. It's a new muscle they would have to work. And also regulatory risk. You wouldn't necessarily think of regulatory risk here with AMD and Xilinx, but it is a different kind of world we're trying to get through here. Obviously, U.S.-China tensions running very hot. Some think are only going to get hotter. That'll be interesting to see how that plays here. Anybody left, Ed, to buy? <laughs> There's always somebody left to buy. Yes, as a matter of fact, um, and Broadcom, which is one of the biggest acquisition uh, hungry companies, our biggest M&A companies out there, period. Last quarter, CEO Hock Tan basically said they're going to be back in the market next year buying software, um, mainframe software companies. So you're going to see quite a few more of these, I think, before the semiconductor cycle uh, cools off probably late 2021. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.